Hey guys, Schultzy Phillips here, welcome to my April 3rd DVD update, where I talk about the DVDs and Blu-rays I've gotten over the last two weeks or so. Like I always say guys, if you enjoy these updates, definitely give this video a thumbs up, leave me comments below on what you guys thought about the titles I checked out, any titles you guys have picked up recently, and anything's coming up that you guys suggest I check out for future updates. Now the first one I got from Scream Factory, you know, Shout Factory, Scream Factory line, and this is one, I can't think of a movie besides, you know, It's Follows, which I just saw, which I loved, but that I've heard, you know, so many people ask me about, you know, if I've seen this, what I thought about it, and everything like that. And this the, this one is the Babadook, and it has a really cool, you know, cover on this. You know, when you open it up, and then it comes out with, you know, the Babadook, you know, from the book. So it's like the actual thing from the book. I actually think you can somewhere get the actual book, like a recreation. I think they were having it, like, on Kickstarter or something like that. But really cool that they had this on here. And it's, you know, underneath, too, has another, you know, the alternate cover of the actual, like, poster to the movie. But the movie is basically about, it's about this, um, you know, single mother, you know, her husband died years back, and her son, you know, and the son is having all kinds of these terrible fears, and, you know, scared of the dark, you know, basically he's just paranoid about everything, everything is freaking him out, he's always making, like, you know, creations and things like that to stop monsters and things like that, and then one day, you know, he wants his mom to read him a book, and they end up coming across this book called The Babadook, and, you know, they end up reading it, and basically the book is like a scary book, and it's like, you know, you see the, the, this creature in the book, and it says all kinds of dark, disturbing things in it, and then from that, the kid becomes, like, obsessed with the Babadook, and that the Babadook is going to come and get him, that, you know, he's, out, he's after him, but, you know, eventually... You know, it's the kid, but then it starts affecting the mother, and it's this really creepy stuff. It's a really, it's one of those movies too where if the kid wasn't good, the movie wouldn't work because you know the kid had to be like play scared and like a lot of real creeped out things like that. He did an amazing job playing like terrified, and it really has that kind of terrifying kind of vibe to it. Kind of reminds me of you know other things, kind of like The Conjuring, you know, movies that are kind of like throwbacks to, you know, like 70s, like late 70s, early 80s kind of horror movies, like The Changeling and things like that. It kind of has that kind of vibe, some modern aspects of it as well, but a very, very creepy story with the, you know, with the with the monster and what they're seeing and things like that. Just a very creepy atmosphere and vibe all around, all the acting, the mother was great in this. Definitely would check this out. It's not one of those ones, too, when people are going, oh, they're all talking about it, then you see it. Because there's been a lot of those ones when I see it, and I'm like, I didn't care for that at all. Not with this. This, I really did like this. It has on here deleted scenes, you know, interviews, and then um, the director's other short film that she made is on here as well as a feature. Uh, the next one, and this is one of those ones that as a kid, I've always loved this movie. I remember buying the DVD of this at Virgin Records. You know, they're all gone now, but always have like memories of buying the DVD at this Virgin Records, you know, at, uh, I can exactly remember where it was, it was downtown Disney, used to always, you know, when I used to go to Florida all the time, and this is, you know, the Toby Hooper film, Invaders from Mars, and this is just a movie that I have always loved this, great transfer on this, you know, this is from Screen Factory as well, and this is like, what a Toby Hooper's you know, um, you know, more, it's kind of more of a kid's horror film, but it still has, like, some creepy aspects, kind of like other movies that are, like, kind of more for kid audiences, like The Willies, and so there's other ones that are kind of horror movies, but more for a kid audience, and that's what this was. But to me, I always thought it was kind of creepy. You know, it's, it's, it's a, one of those movies, though, the aspect of it that deals with the army, it kind of like really starts off strong, kind of like the army stuff isn't isn't perfect. Then at the end, it's really cool again. But like there's some like some, some rocky stuff in this movie that I noticed more a little bit, you know, seeing it now. Um, but I still really love the movie. You know, Canon produced this movie, and I always loved the kind of stuff that they made back in the 80s. But, you know, and I never even realized that the kid in this was actually, you know, Karen Black's son in real life. For some reason, I never knew that. But it's basically about this kid who, um... You know, it's all about looking at the stars with his father, and his father, you know, works for NASA and things like that. One day, he ends up seeing this, like, alien ship land in his backyard, tells his father about it at night. The father's like, oh, I'll go look at it tomorrow, and he goes to look at it. And the next morning, he sees the father, and the father's changed and very different and real cold acting. And then, you know, the mother starts changing, and you find out, you know, something is happening to the people in the town, and they're being changed by what you, you know, is probably the alien ship. And there's some really creepy stuff in this. 
um, the teacher character, you know, played by Louise Fletcher. I love that aspect of the movie. And really, for some reason, forgot that the mom was played by Lorraine Newman, you know, who I always loved in Problem Child 2 is Luanda. I don't know. I just really love this movie. It's a creepy kind of vibe, cool alien film. And it kind of reminds me a little bit of Explorers. It's another one. I would love if, you know, Scream Factory did a release of that because that's a really cool... I feel like that would make a pretty cool addition film. Um... But, you know, it has on here, you know, a making of with Toby Hooper, a bunch of new interviews, um, you know, storyboards, and then a bunch of different stuff on here. Like I, like I said, really good transfer in this. But definitely check this out. Like, this is the movie, too, that I feel like it's going to be nostalgia to a lot of people. Uh, the next one, Scream Factory as well, is a double pack, which has Carrie and the Rage Carrie 2. Um, you know, the Carrie, which is the Carrie remake for TV, which stars, um, you know... The, it's, you know, Angela Bates, who is from, you know, May and Sick Girl and a bunch of different movies. Always was a fan of her. And I really liked the... I, I actually thought the TV remake was not bad. You know, it's not a perfect movie or anything like that. But it really, you know, Angela Bates, I thought, did a good job as Carrie. But it's the same pretty much story about the girl, you know, and what happens to her and, you know, the thing with her mother and the telekinetic powers and all that kind of stuff. Um... It has on here, though, a brand new audio commentary with the director, and then The Rage Carry 2, which is, to me, one of those movies that when you watch it, really has, like, that 1999, you know, early, two, like, the beginning of 2000 feel to it. Like, if you know, I remember the music and all that kind of stuff, really has that vibe, and really has that, like, you could definitely tell that's when it's from. You know, as you can tell, like, I would have been listening to Limp Bizkit music back then when this was, it just has that kind of feel to it, you know what I mean, that, um... But it's basically, though, a sequel to the Carrie film about another girl who ends up having telekinetic powers and starts developing them, and when things start happening, you know, she's bullied and things like that. You know, Mina Savarni was in this movie, but only in the beginning, and I don't know why they didn't have her in it more. Like, I really wish her character would have lasted longer, because I've always been a fan of Mina Savarni, and, like, especially because, like, to me, she's the only person in this movie that I really you know, would, would want to see more, and it's just too bad that she had to die so early. I know it's, you know, talking about something that was made in 1999, but, you know, I don't think Mina Savarni was even really that known yet, so that was probably what happened. But, you know, the movie doesn't hold up amazing, but I always kind of liked it. It was one of those things that I remember really liking when it first came out, and there's some cool stuff. It's essentially a remake, though, because the same stuff happens to the girl, the same stuff with, like, a prom, but this one is more a party. But, like I said, it, it's cool. I'm glad that these are out on Blu-ray, though, and has one here a commentary with the director, alternate endings, you know, and additional scenes on, you know, Carrie 2. The next one, and these ones, I had heard about these and never heard them, and these are um, from Shout Factory, um, you know, that, not the Scream line. This is Eddie and the Cruisers, and Eddie and the Cruisers 2, um, Eddie Lives, but it's kind of like a spoiler in a weird way to the first one. I guess you could say it is. You know, technically, like, because, like, to me, I hadn't seen the other one, but then I'm like, well, it says Eddie Lives, so does Eddie live? You know, so kind of like, man, why did they call it that in the sequel? Um, I'm talking talk mainly about the first one, because I really liked the first one. It was actually pretty cool, and, like, had a really cool kind of, like, vibe to it, like, wondering if Eddie died and what happened, because it was basically about this rock band that was popular and, like, on the, pretty much the verge of, you know, getting really big, and years later, you know, the head frontrunner of the music died back, they saw what they believe his car went off a cliff like 20 years back, and, you know, it's in the 80s now, and their music has made a huge comeback, and it's very popular, and this newspaper, this girl who writes for a paper, is, wants to kind of do a story about them since the band, the songs are becoming hits again, and she wants to track down the band and talk to them. And they're, you know, trying to investigate if Eddie really did die because the band member is kind of like, oh, I don't think he did. And that's essentially what it is and kind of like, you know, the twists and trying to, like, uncover things. And there was aspects of it, too, like, in this one point that kind of reminded me of, like, Texas Chainsaw Massacre 2. Like, if you know, like, the underground thing. Like, I don't know why I kept thinking of that when I was watching this because, like, this one place that they went to the movie kind of looked like, you know, where Leatherface was hanging out and, you know, living in the second one. It just had that kind of vibe. Because, like I said, the movie kind of has, like, this dark atmosphere to, fear to it. But it involves, too, like, talking to mainly this one guy who's now a teacher who used to be in the band and talking to him. And he's kind of the guy who really thinks that he might not have died. And I like this movie. Like I said, I really thought it was a pretty cool movie. Would definitely recommend checking these out. Like, I feel like they were um, movies that I think they, like, aired a lot that I was reading on HBO and things like that. The next one from um, Shaw Factory 
is, you know, Metal, Her Metal Herland Chronicles, the complete series. And this is like an interesting kind of anthology kind of series. Um, it's like a sci-fi kind of anthology and it deals with like a whole bunch of different stuff. It like deals with like medieval stuff and deals with like people living out in a bomb shelter. And it's like a whole bunch of different things. They all kind of revolve around like the space and the same kind of like it's like a very strange, hard to explain show. I was worried about trying to how to explain this, but it's a French produced show, but it's in English, but also has, you know, alternate French episodes of the show as well. It has San Diego Comic Con preview on this. Um, it's a cool, though, like I said, different take on anthology series. And it has a whole bunch of people in this. Rucker Howard is in this. Um, the one guy from, um, you know, Alien vs. Predator, no, I mean, Alien uh, 4. And, you know, Alien Resurrection, and, um, you know, City of Lost Children is in this, because I, you know, because he lives in France, and, you know, he was in this. It's like, a, like I said, it's an interesting, different kind of, more of a sci-fi kind of take of anthology kind of series. And the next one from Warner Brothers, and this is one of these movies, you know, I've been, you know, good friends with the director of this, Adam Rifkin, but, you know, before I ever knew Adam Rifkin, this is like one of these movies that I've always been a fan of. I remember, you know, with this specific movie, going and buying the poster of this in Suncoast, you know, back when Suncoast existed, and, you know, because I love this movie so much. Like, I remember in, when this first came out in 19... I think it was, like, 99 it came out. I remember, you know, watching the, the original DVD of this one all the time. And I feel like, too, because I was always watching the features on this, and all the features in, you know, this Detroit Rock City, but all the features on this are carried over from the old DVD. And I feel like half of the reason why I wanted to get into, like, doing film stuff for some reason, was from watching this movie, especially the features on this, because like, it had some like behind-the-scenes stuff, and I remember that was like one of the things that really got me interested, you know, in that. And it also was one of the things too in the early days of you know DVDs when they had features. And I remember like listening to commentaries on this. It was just always a movie that I really loved. And it's about these, you know, four friends. You know, it's you know set in like '78. All in you know who are really you know when Kiss is at the heyday. You know, want to go and see Kiss. And, you know, they end up having tickets, and the one kid's, you know, mother is very Christian and really is against the band, you know, played by Lynn Shea. Lynn Shea is amazing in this movie. Always been a fan of Lynn Shea, and, you know, I'm so happy for her now with the Insidious films and everything with that. And, you know, it's basically, though, she ends up finding out about the thing and then destroying the tickets. And then the other guy ends up, you know, thinking that they're screwed, there's no way they're going to get it. End up calling, you know, having a radio contest where they can win the tickets, he ends up winning the tickets, and it's kind of like their quest to get to, you know, Detroit, to get to the, you know, the concert. And that's essentially what the movie is, but it's, you know, when they get there, everything goes wrong. And then they kind of split off, and there's like the whole night of what they do, you know, trying to get the tickets. And it's just a really fun movie. You know, Eddie Furlong's in this movie. Uh, Giuseppe Andrews in this movie. I just, it's one of those movies, that, like I said, I have always loved this movie, and it's such a fun movie, and, like, you know, it's really cool to watch this again in HD. Looks great on Blu ray. Uh, the next one is another one that I've been a fan of this forever, and this is, you know, Empire Records. This is from Warner Brothers as well, and um, this is another one, though, like I said, that I remember always watching this. I think this came out in 95, I think. So I remember this would have been ones I was watching on VHS when it first came out. I don't think I saw this in theaters, or I don't think so. But this is one I know. I remember always watching this, and you know when I think of like, you know, it's kind of like a cool throwback to like record stores and things like that. Because there aren't that many big record stores. As you know, there's Amoeba Records, and there's a couple sporadic ones. But you know when this movie came out, they were everywhere and they're all over the place. And this is before you know the internet and all that kind of stuff. So this is at the heyday of it, and it's basically about this record store that's gonna you know, he's having some problems financially and is going to be bought out by this music town. One of the employees finds out about this, ends up taking money from the safe and going to Vegas, no, to, to Atlantic City, and hoping to, you know, turn things around and be able to, so they can, you know, the guy can buy the record store and keep it from, you know, ending up becoming a corporate chain kind of record store. Um, you know, it's kind of like an FYE. I think Music Town actually was a chain back then. And that's essentially what it is. And, you know, of course, he loses all the money. And it's pretty much about the day-to-day -day of the people at the record store. You know, Renee Zellweger's in this movie. Uh, Ethan Emery's in this movie. And it's kind of just about the people in the record store and the whole day and, you know, thinking about how they're going to save this place and kind of about, 
you know, everyone that works there kind of has their own sets of problems. You know, the place is going to, you know, get sold, but, you know, the one has depression issues. They're, they all have kind of issues, and it's all kind of them kind of working it out together and kind of dealing with it. And I don't know, I've, like I said, I've always loved this movie. It's got deleted scenes on here and uh, three music videos. But it's another one I feel like a lot of people know it, and you just have to check it out. Now, the next one, when I saw the trailer for this, I was like, I don't know if I'm going to like this and what I'm going to think of this. Because it said you couldn't tell exactly what kind of tone the movie was going to take. And I really like this movie. And, you know, I'm with Ryan Reynolds, to me, it's hit and miss. You know, I usually like Ryan Reynolds, but some movies I don't care for him in. But this movie, to me, is his best movie. I mean, this is his best performance. I thought that he really, like, I'm more of a fan of him than I was, you know, after, you know, before this movie, because I, I really thought he was great in this, you know, they also had Anna Kendrick and, uh, Gemma Anderson, who was in that really great horror movie, uh, called, I think it was like, I don't know how to say it, it was a great, amazing vampire film, if you haven't seen that, look up her name, look up the vampire movie with her and the actress who was in The Host, um, definitely have got to watch that one, that's amazing, but this one's called The Voices, this is pretty much about Ryan Reynolds, who's in this small town, working at this kind of, like, shipping place, you know, and he's pretty much nuts. He's, you know, he's hearing, um, you know, his dogs and his, and his cat talking to him, and they're kind of all telling him things, telling him things to do, and, you know, he ends up really liking the one British girl who works at the place that he's at, wants to take her out, and, you know, they finally end up going out, and he ends up killing her out, killing her, and then you know, because the animals told him to, and taking her and putting her into, like, little teeny, like, storage, like, kind of things you put food into, and, like, keeping him in the house, and then he kind of starts meeting Anna Kendrick's character, and it's just a very creepy, weird movie, and it's about him seeing his psychiatrist, and it's just amazing. There's some amazing stuff in this that I really love, especially the end. The end is really cool, and there's stuff in it when they show what Ryan Reynolds sees, his character sees, and what's really there. And that was the most amazing aspect of the movie, was showing when they, you know, would cut to what was really there. And it was like, whoa. What, like, like what certain things look like, as opposed to the way that he was seeing it. Amazing, amazing, weird movie. And the end, you know, it happens, the, the credits is amazing. Stick through the credits. I love this movie. Uh, cannot recommend this enough. It's my kind of movie. It's weird. And I, I really liked it. Um, the next one, um, and, you know, this has gotten some mixed opinions. I like this movie. It reminded me a little bit of, like, um, very bad things kind of humor. I mean, some of the acting in this was kind of weird. And, like, I don't know if Katherine Heigl was totally into this movie exactly. Um, I think it might have just been trying to get it done. But still, I, I liked it. And it was, based, it was her and um, Patrick Wilson in Home Sweet Hell. And it was, you know, Patrick Wilson works at this... Um, you know, furniture type place, and Katherine Heigl's like a stay-at-home mom, and, you know, she's real naggy and real controlling and has a calendar of every day, what they're going to do this day, and even the days they're going to have sex together. Like, everything is, like, written down, and, you know, uh, Patrick Wilson is really, like, pretty much miserable about the whole thing. And his job, he ends up hiring this new employee, and he ends up having a relationship with her. And, you know, the relationship is very weird, and you see these other characters, and you're like, what? What is the reason of this? Is this woman trying to get money from him? And what exactly is going on? And basically, what you know, why it's called Home Sweet Hell is because Catherine Heigl ends up finding out about this relationship. And is like, you're going to kill her. You know, you're, you're going to kill this woman. And that's where the movie takes the real dark turn to it. You know, Jim Belushi's in this is one of the, like, the furniture salesmen. And he really fit in that part. And you could, you could tell he was having fun with this movie. I like this, though. Like I said, it's not going to be for everybody. It's not a perfect movie or anything like that. But it's a fun kind of, if you like very bad things and you like dark comedies, that kind of vibe to it, really dark movies that, you know, you think are going to be, like, not really gory. And then, that like, whoa, with the gore. That's sort of what it does. But as I'm here, deleted scenes, pretty funny outtakes on this, and um, a bunch of different other things on it. Uh, the next one from Synapse Films, it has, you know, a reversible cover on this, too. You know, the old cover from the old Synapse, you know, DVD that was out for this a while back. And they also, there's like a remake of this. It's, I don't know if I ever watched it or not. 
I think it was like 2007 they made a remake of this and it's Long Weekend and it's one of those pretty cool, you know, uh, Day of the Animal kind of movies. You know, that was another movie that was sort of like this where all the animals have gone crazy but it's about a couple that ends up going out into like the, the into the woods on a vacation and they've got their own sets of problems. They're not totally that happy and they've got sort of issues and the wife isn't that sure she even wants to go out and do this but as soon as they get out there you know they start noticing very weird things are going on with the animals and it's kind of like the animals are all out to get them and they kind of have to survive and you know and it's like kind of worrying like because they have a dog with them is the dog going to turn and, you know it's like, that's pretty much essentially what this is but a really good brand new transfer of this movie really looks great like I said this is just a cool animals attack movie on here which I would definitely recommend checking out if you like those kind of films um, and like I said too it's got that kind of vibe too of Day of the Animals which I think was first, but I'm not sure. But like during that time, they made a couple of different, you know, animal attack movies. And the next ones are from Twilight Time. The first one is an Oliver Stone film, which I kept on thinking. I think I might have seen some of this movie, and I think I did. I think this movie I remember got played a lot on HBO. And when I was thinking of this movie, I kept on, you know, because Billy Bob Thornton was in this movie, I kept on wanting to watch Chopper Chicks in Zombie Town again, because like you know, it's out of print, you can't get it anywhere, but. It was making me want to watch this again for some reason. But this is, you know, the movie U-Turn, and it's actually pretty good. You know, there, there's a part in the, like, in right near the end where it kind of slows down a little bit with the movie, but I really like this. It's basically about Sean Penn, who's, you know, taking this money from these, like, kind of mobster kind of guys, and ends up driving through the desert, and his car ends up breaking down this really small, weird town where everybody's kind of weird, and all the people are strange. And he breaks down and takes it to this car place to work on it. And the guy is played by Billy Bob Thornton. And I think it's one of Billy Bob Thornton's, like, you know, coolest, weirdest roles in this movie. Just he's, he's, I mean, He was my favorite thing in the whole movie. He was so odd in this movie. He's, like, the guy working on the car and saying all kinds of weird stuff. And, you know, Sean Penn's character ends up meeting, you know, Jennifer Lopez's character. And Jennifer Lopez's husband in the movie wants Sean Penn to kill his wife. Jennifer, Jennifer Lopez's character wants him, Sean Penn to kill you know, the husband, it's all that kind of stuff going on, and at the same time, the mobsters are, like, on the, on his tail, gonna come back and get him, and, you know, they've already cut off, like, two of his fingers, and they're gonna cut off the rest on the one hand, and that's essentially what it is, is this whole town, and him trying to figure out what he's gonna do, and how he's gonna get his car out of there, because he has no money, because of all the things that have happened in this town, but a really great transfer on this, and it has a brand new Oliver Stone introduction about him talking about this movie, which was actually it's only a couple minutes long, but it was very interesting, you know, him talking about this movie now, you know, and his take on it and everything like that. Uh, the next one is the from Twilight Time as well is um, H.G. Wells, The First Man in the Moon. And I think I had seen this one a long time ago, and this is about, you know, a ship that goes up to moon, you know, the moon, like it's going to be the first time anyone goes up there, and the spacemen end up discovering this kind of thing up there, which is like a paper and saying something about someone who went up there before, you know, years back, and they're like, how did anyone go up there? So they end up taking that back to Earth, and then, you know, trying to do an investigation, I'm trying to figure out who was that that, you know, went up to the moon before, because they didn't know anything about anything that had happened before, and they track down to this kind of crazy scientist guy, and he explains to them about how he did it, and it kind of flashes back to him as a younger man, showing about his inventions and things like that, and how he got up to the moon. But has on here, you know, um, some new interviews and auto commentary with um, Ray ha Harryhausen, and um, you know, a featurette as well in the movie. But great transfer on this one. And the next one is the original um, Jules, Jules Verne's, you know, Journey to the Center of the Earth. You know, this has been remade. Um, I think it was I don't remember if Rock was in. The remake? I think he was in the first one. I know this Journey 2, I remember, no, he was in that one. I'm pretty sure. No, I think it was actually Brendan Fraser in the, yeah, Brendan Fraser was in the remake of this one, um, Journey to the Center of the Earth. But this is the original story, you know, about the expedition, how they get to the center of the Earth, and all the weird kind of creatures they see and things like that. I've always enjoyed this movie. It's just a really fun movie. Again, too, um, I believe this one was actually, unless I'm crazy, I feel like this might have been released before and it was, you know, limited and went out of print, and this is the new release edition. I'm, I'm, I might be wrong about that, but I, I know that they did that with, you know, Fright Night, but I, I think that was with this one, but I might be wrong. And it also has, you know, I, isolated score on here, uh, an auto commentary track in the original trailer, but just a really cool one. Really love the covers that they put on these movies as well. 
Uh, the next one from uh, Camp Motion Pictures, and it's also have the, you know, there's a limited edition version that you can get, which includes a poster, the DVD, and a VHS release of it as well. You know, it's actually in a case and everything. It's pretty cool, and it's called Kill Granny Kill, and it's basically about, you know, this... You know, it's like cannibalistic grandmother who is, you know, killing people and eating them. And she takes like an ad out, like a kind of like a Craigslist thing for a housekeeper to come there and help around the house and things like that. And she's already, you know, killed and eaten half of the other ones that come into the into the house and things like that. It's essentially about this girl who goes there and starts, you know, with the, you know, working for the grandmother, and then this, she also starts liking the grandmother's grandson. There's some really weird stuff in this movie. I always love movies, too, that are about, you know, old people, like, attacking, killing people, and that kind of stuff. And that, you know, this definitely has that. It was a really fun movie. You may see somebody looks like me in it for a real quick second. Well, you see me in it, you know, for, like, a quick cameo. But I wanted to review this one because I have a real quick thing. I, was, I just wanted to talk about it because I actually was watching this one and going, this is a really fun movie. Like, I really think this is a cool one. But I'm, you know, on a thing in here on the TV that I filmed. But it's a, it's a cool movie. It really is. Uh, the next one from, um, I think it's Team Marketing and the Orchard is the title. And this is one that I was really interested in seeing. I always love movies like, you know, that are about in the woods and that kind of stuff. And this is called um, Preservation. And this one example of a movie that starts off kind of like normal about just people going, like these friends going out in the woods. It's a couple and the one's brother going out into the woods. And then at the end, it gets crazy. It's got kind of vibes of like, you're next. But it even gets further than that. It gets like really brutal. The end of the movie it's very, becomes a very brutal, you know, it gets worse and worse as it goes along. Especially about who it is that's after them. And I, I don't know, to me it really worked. It was pretty effective, but it's a, you know, a couple that goes out there, you know, and they're one's brother, and they go out there to sleep, and the brother has, you know, been to the, the war, and they kind of think that he might be nuts as it is. There might be something the matter with him. And, you know, they wake up one night, and their tent's gone, everything's missing, all their stuff is gone, they have no idea how the tent was stolen, they start looking at the one's brother, thinking maybe he did it, maybe he, you know, cracked up out in the woods, and he was, the, you know, the reason for this. But you figure out, though, it was not the brother. And there's these people out there in these masks that are after them and, you know, shooting at them. And they've took their guns and everything. It's a really cool, like I said, real brutal movie. It takes a real crazy turn. Would definitely recommend checking this out one. Look up the trailer to this. I really like this one. I really thought that this was a lot better than I thought it was going to be. Uh, the next one, this is one that I actually saw this in theaters. And I saw that it was a while ago, and I was like thinking, is this ever going to come out? And I was worried, you know, kind of like this and that other movie, Innocence. Because I always like to see kind of movies that have like, you know, really limited movies when they only, like movies that only go to like, you know, a hundred or less theaters if I can, if they're near me. So I just saw that movie, A Girl Like Her, which was great. But um, this one's called Jen, you know, Jen Third Race. And this is, you know, it was, it was a PG-13 horror movie, but actually it was kind of a creepy, weird kind of movie that I really liked. And, you know, it starts off as like a flashback about this crazy looking creature, um, you know, you know, living in this weird kind of shacky thing. And, you know, it's years later and it's this couple, newly married, married couple. And um, basically they start seeing, she starts seeing and hearing weird things. And, you know, this creature is coming for them and they're trying to figure out what's going on. They go to the priest and then they end up finding this priest who can kind of help them with his assistant. And it's like them trying to like battle this, this crazy demon creature that's after them. And it's this great scene with like a battle when they slow down, slow it down. They play the music and this is the music they played in Natural Born Killers like that. Well, believe it, like that, it was like that cool Indian song where it was like amazing like the way I, I, I couldn't even sing it but they played it a couple times in Natural Born Killers it was that exact song and like that scene was so cool in this movie like I said this like I was so happy when I saw this was coming to DVD because I really liked this movie it was like a weird different movie and like I hope the director does other stuff and I, I saw I think he has a new movie that he's doing and I don't know if they're going to do a sequel to this one or not because it's definitely the kind of movie that they could do more of um, the next one from Lionsgate is Little House on the Prairie, Season 5, the Blu-ray. I've always liked this show. I've really, you know, used to, as a kid, I saw sporadic episodes of this, but really been watching them with, you know, the Blu-ray releases. And like I've always said with this show, they've done a really good job cleaning this up. And it makes you wonder, like, all the other shows that, you know, could get Blu-ray releases. And hopefully, you know, they continue to put 
other kind of different shows on Blu-ray as well. But, you know, if you don't know the show, it's basically about this family that lives out in kind of like the middle of nowhere in this small town. And kind of like, it's a show about kind of doing good things and helping people out and kind of problems and things like that. The episode in here I liked was this one about this old woman that the kids were friends with. And, you know, she her house, she didn't pay her bills or something like that with her taxes and the house was getting taken away. And the kids have to try and figure out how to get the house back. And they come up with the ideas of making it the new people who bought the house who are like the shopkeepers who own the shop that they're always in, try and scare her away, you know, scare the new people away. I don't know, it's just a fun show. It has on here, you know, uh, part five of the, of the making of, you know, remembering the show. But like I said, though, really great transfer in the show. Just a really cool, you know, 70s show. That I've, I, I've always liked that, like I said, since a kid. Uh, the next one from Lionsgate as well is Bark Ranger, which has... John Lovitch as the Ranger. It's kind of, you know me, I always like these kind of like animal doll kind of movies. I feel like I probably watched so many of these things ever since like as a kid watching Bingo. You know, Bingo though wasn't a talking dog. They, you know, I always sometimes like them though better when they don't talk, but it's kind of like more just like they're doing things. But this is like a talking one. It's kind of, it was, I kind of liked it. It kind of has that throwback vibe to kind of feel like a 90s movie a little bit. Because it has, like, bumbling crooks in it, like Home Alone. And I haven't, you know, it's funny, though, like, they still make kids' movies, like, with that kind of vibe. Like, you know, even Remote in the 90s, they, you know, they were knocking off, kind of, Home Alone. And I just kind of like, in a weird way, that they still make those kind of movies. You know, they're still making, like, movies with bumbling crooks. And they're always, like, the two of them. Always two. Never usually more than two. It's usually got to be two bumbling crooks. And this one, they end up robbing the ranger station. They end up taking this safe. It's about the dog and the one kid, you know, you know, the kids, they kind of go on this adventure to try and, you know, they find this map, trying to find the gold, but, you know, you see the gold is taken by these bumbling crooks and, you know, the ranger station, the park may be closing down because they have to get money, so that's why they want to go on this adventure to get the gold. But that's essentially what it is. And John Lovitz is actually pretty good, though, as the voice. The next one from Lionsgate as well is I Really Hate My Ex. And this was actually kind of funny. It was all done, like a lot of it, like me and Al, like, through the internet, like people talking. But the, some of the talking stuff was kind of weird because like they were like green screened in really odd. So like it was like you could tell. It was like, why are they green screened? Why didn't they just like tell the actors just to go in their house and just, you know, record the scenes of them in front of their computer doing it? It was one of those ones, too, it was like, I wish I knew about it because I would have definitely said, oh, I'll shoot something of me going, yes, I'm, my relationship was like this. Because that's basically what it was. It like had all these different reactions of old people talking about relationships from the show. But this one woman ends up calling in talking about you know her relationship. It's, I really hate my ex, like you said, talking about her relationship and how her you know boyfriend or whatever that it was cheating on her or something had happened he wanted to leave her and how he she was talking about how she kidnapped him to try and get answers from him and also but then they don't believe her so then her two friends come on and both of them kidnap their husbands as well so it's basically cutting back and forth between them on the show telling about what they did and then the, then the stuff of them actually kidnapping the husbands and what happens and trying to get answers like I said it was actually pretty funny you know it has on here behind the scenes as well uh, the next one from Olive Films is um, Night of the Scarecrow. And this is one of those ones I think I watched on like USA or something like that years ago. Haven't seen this in a really long time. It has on here though, you know, um, Crispin Glover's father, um, Bruce Glover is in this movie. And, um, you know, Stephen Root is in this movie. It's Night of the Scarecrow. But it's about this, like, you know, this curse that ends up coming on the town and the scarecrow coming back to life and coming after all these kids and attacking them. You know, just a really cool, creepy scarecrow attack movie. There was a couple other scarecrow movies, too, like Scarecrows and then Dark Knight of the Scarecrow, which was more of a serious movie in tone. But, um, you know, it's Jeff Burr who directed... I believe it was Leatherface, a Texas Chainsaw Massacre, did this one. Has on here, you know, um, interviews and then a commentary with the director and then, um, you know, still gallery of music and commentary. But I like this movie. Just a cool, evil scarecrow coming back, to, you know, to life, going around and killing the people in the town. Uh, the next one from Comedy Central is Inside Amy Schumar, you know, season one and two. You know, Amy Schumer, I believe, is going to be the host of the MTV Movie Awards. And that new movie, I'm interested in seeing that, that Judd Apatow directed. He didn't write it. I think it's the first movie that he, it's, you know, she, Amy Schumer wrote and stars in it, but he's directing it. So I think it's actually the first movie that he's ever directed that he didn't write. And this is basically a sketch comedy show that Amy Schumer does, and it cuts between skits 
and then like some stand-up acts and then like on the street interviewing people and things like that. It kind of has a vibe of Chappelle's show. It is funny how so many of these shows kind of model themselves off of what Chappelle did. And it makes you though wish and hope that Chappelle, you know, he appeared in, you know, in the background at the Beebler roast. And it would be amazing if he came back and did this. But Amy Schumer is pretty funny. Um, not as funny to me as Sarah Silverman, though. I think Sarah Silverman to me is a little stronger. But I'm, I'm definitely interested, though, in seeing, you know, the movie that she's in. Uh, the next one is um, Echoes from, you know, um, Anchor Bay. And this is basically about this woman who's, you know, a writer, this girl who's a writer, and she goes with her boyfriend, you know, to kind of get away and goes to this Arizona kind of glass house getaway. The second she get there, gets there, though, the boyfriend has to leave immediately after because she's like, oh, well, there's problems on the set, and I need to be there to help with the writing and things like that. So he ends up leaving her there for a couple days. And when she's there, she starts, like, seeing these things, and she's having, like, sleep paralysis and things like that and she's like you know i've had that a couple times too when you like wake up and then you like see crazy things like it's happened to me like once or twice you know uh, not all the time or anything but that's basically what happens to her in this and there's some creepy stuff and it's out in the middle of the desert and there's like a weird guy next door lives down there he's always lurking around and kind of about her getting freaked out by everything that she's seeing and stuff i thought that it had some creepy stuff but not, like, perfect or anything like that. But that's essentially what the movie was about. Uh, the next one from E1 is uh, Hayden Christensen, Nicolas Cage movie, Outcast. I did not love this movie. Um, Nicolas Cage was in this, though, doing this, like, unique British accent that was kind of, like, weird. And he's like, we've got problems going on here at Scream Park. Uh, he wasn't doing it like that, but he was going, we will fight for our times. Or fight... It was awful, though. It was bad. I mean, I can't lie. It was a bad accent. But that kind of made it cool. Like, I really wanted to watch just his stuff. Because, like, he's in the beginning and then disappears. And I was like, why did he have to disappear and then come back? He came back. But he came back a long time into the movie. I was, like, wishing that he would have been in it more. But it's, like, kind of like... You know, Hayden Christensen is, like, kind of helping fight with his family. But Nicolas Cage is there. And... I don't know, I didn't pick up, take away too much from the movie, to be honest with you. But it has on here a making of and interviews. But I, so some, some movies I just I can't get into it very much. Uh, the next one from Wild Eye Releasing is Enter the Dangerous Mind. And um, I actually thought this was pretty good. Thomas Decker's in this movie. And this is about this guy who basically is almost like a Skrillex kind of guy. He makes like dubstep music and things like that. But, you know, he's it's a, kind of like he's hearing things and... And then he kind of is going to this one place and meeting these people, and it's like, oh, he's meeting people at, like for help at like a clinic because he's got problems, and he's pretty much like hearing things and seeing things, and people are telling him to do things. And Thomas Decker's character, you know, you find out very early on is in his head, and it's kind of got like Fight Clubby stuff going on with him seeing things and hearing things and people telling him to do stuff and. I actually kind of liked this movie. I thought it was a pretty well-acted movie. Really liked Thomas Decker in this movie. Um, and Nikki Reed was really good in this as well. I know she was in the Twilight movies. A couple other different things. But I liked this movie. I thought there was an interesting, different kind of take on the whole kind of schizophrenia kind of movies. The next one from Alchemy, which I think used to be called, um, you know, was originally was called Millennium Entertainment has a new company name, and this is based on a true story, Kidnapping Mr. Heineken, and it's basically about the actual kidnapping of, you know, the head of the Heineken company, Mr. Heineken. It's about these friends that were kind of planning this heist, and they needed money to kidnap him, and ba that's basically what it is. It's basically planning the kidnapping and kidnapping him, and Mr. Heineken is played by, you know, Anthony Hopkins, and, you know, Jim Sturgis is in this movie, um, Sam Worthington, so it's a well, a really good cast in this um, you know, and Anthony Hopkins was really cool in this. But it's like a kind of a typical kind of kidnapping kind of vibe movie. But it has on here, um, you know, deleted scenes and extended scenes. But if you want to see like a kidnapping kind of movie, like a true crime kind of thing, it was actually okay, but nothing amazing. The next one from Ark Entertainment is John Doe Vigilante. This is one of those kind of vigilante movies about a guy, you know, it's kind of like, well, is what he's doing good or is it bad? And, you know, he, in the beginning of the movie, you know, he's arrested, but there's kind of like, 
you know, he's been taking out kind of like all the bad guys. If you've done anything bad, that, you know, he's going to, you know, take him out. But, you know, he's in, you know, being questioned by the cops and things like that. Like, why did you do it and everything like that? But there's also people outside, like, protesting it, saying, well, he's done a good thing and he's been helping clean up crime in this town. So it's one of those kind of movies where it's like, well, is what he's doing good? And it flashes back to him and, you know, what he's been doing and how he ended up getting to where he was, which, you know, is in the police station. Has on here, you know, a bunch of different features on here, auto commentaries, behind the scenes, and a bunch of different stuff, you know, like this. But there's been a lot of other kind of movies that are kind of like these vigilante, you know, kind of justice kind of movies. But this one was actually, I, I thought it was pretty well done. I thought it was an entertaining one. Uh, the next one from um, Image, you know, RLJ Images, um, you know, the director of this did um, Contracted, which I love Contracted. Contracted was a really great movie, um, you know, Eric England. And um, this one is Roadside, which I think he had done a couple years back. Um, and it's one of those movies where it started off really good. Like, I, in the beginning, I really loved it. I was, like, thinking, like, oh, this is going to be cool. Like, but then it is, but it's basically, though, about a couple that is going on, you know, like a trip. They're going, to, I think they're going to see family. And they end up stopping off at like a roadside kind of convenient place. And but before they get there, though, there's somebody weird on the road that's kind of like following them behind them, and you know, being close. And then they try and get around the guy, and then he speeds after them and almost runs them off the road, and they almost get into a crash. And of course, you know, when they get to the convenience store, they go inside, and the guy is in there, and he's like questioning the guy, and he's like, "Well, I don't want any beef with you," and things like that. So you're kind of thinking, "Oh, is the movie going to be about?" that guy after them or something like that. Well, when they end up leaving the place, you know, leaving the, um, the convenience store, then on the road there's like this tree down in the middle of the road. The guy gets out to pick it up and move it. That's when the movie stalls out. Like I said, the beginning of the movie was really having a cool vibe. Then it stalls out. And it stalls out really pretty bad. Like, it stalls out like, oh, man. And because it's basically once he gets out of the car, somebody out in the woods saying, you know, uh, you, if you get back in your car, I'm going to shoot you. He's basically holding them at gunpoint, and he can't get in the car, he can't do anything. So it's essentially about what happens with the guy holding him hostage. But that's what it is. It's just, you know, it, I don't know. It's just one of those movies where it, 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 really, it really was starting off so strong, and then it just stalled out so bad there. And it, and it was really hard for it to pick back up. And, like... It, it's not that it's terrible or anything like that. I, I, I liked it in a way, but Contracted was an amazing movie. It was amazing that that will live on as something so good. This just wasn't as good. It just, it just wasn't. There's nothing more you can say on that. Um, but it's still worth checking out, though, if you like that kind of, like, somebody after them and them held at hostage. And there is some other interesting aspects of things that happen, and it's just not as cool. Um... But I do want to see the new one that he did that Scal Compton is in, which I think they just finished shooting. Um, the next one, though, is um, Cut from MPI, I mean MTI. And this is about these filmmakers that, you know, work for like a camera company and they come up with the idea that they want to make their own movie, but they want to have it all be real. So they want to go around and kind of scare people and things like that. But it ends up taking a terrible turn. And for some reason, like, some of the scenes driving around this were reminded me of Nightcrawler. I think it was done before Nightcrawler. It was all a coincidence, though. But it just had, like, vibes of Nightcrawler, just a little bit with them, like, tailing people and things like that. But it's like they're filmmakers, and they just want to, you know, make this movie. But, of course, things start getting worse, and they start paying homeless people to attack women and kill them. And it was okay. I thought there was some kind of cool aspects to it, but nothing amazing. And the last one from, um, you know, Ark Entertainment as well is um, the Walking Dead spoof mixed with um, kind of a spoof of warm bodies and it's the walking deceased and it says imagine a world where the dead are smarter than the living and from none of the creators of scary movies um it was actually kind of a fun movie not like a perfect spoof like i said i've never really seen many episodes of the walking dead so i kind of knew more of the spoof aspect of it with um you know um, warm bodies but it's basically about this guy who ends up waking up in a hospital you know trying to get back with his family and then he there's some cool stuff with the characters that are in the mall, and the, but the one character that's a warm body spoof is this guy um, walking around, and he's kind of sees the one girl and ends up falling in love with her. He's kind of following around to try and find her, and um, you know, kind of talking to himself, kind of like in warm bodies and you know, inner monologue and stuff. But it's you know spoofing the characters in Walking Dead and them 
you know, getting to the farm area. But there was some cool stuff, like I said, in the malls and stuff like that that had kind of like Dawn of the Dead kind of stuff. Like, I always love when they had zombie movie scenes in malls. But it's a kind of a funny spoof. Um, you know, and I think if you knew Walking Dead, you probably would like it more because you would know more about the characters and stuff like that. But just knowing what I did know about it, they did a pretty good job on casting, you know, with likenesses and things like that. And it has on here, you know, quick little behind the scenes. There were cool little fun things about, like, the zombies and the cast and just, like, maybe four minutes each or something. But just a cool thing showing some of the behind the scenes stuff. So anyway, though, guys, that's all for this uh, DVD Blu-ray update, and I'll see you guys later.